All right, so uh, my talk today is on shoulder instability. Uh, it's quite a quite a large topic, so I'll try and cover uh, the more pertinent points that we see more commonly. Um, so the objective of the talk is to talk about the epidemiology, um, the relevant anatomy, uh, pathoanatomy, um, the type of instability we commonly see, um, the important points of the history and examination, uh, the natural history of disease with long-term outcomes, and uh, the different types of operative and non-operative measures um, that we can use. So first of all, um, this is the most dislocated uh, joint in the body. Um, up to one in 50 uh, of the general population will suffer a shoulder dislocation at some stage in their life. Um, as we know, it's a very there's a very high incidence of recurrence, um, which therefore leads to long-term morbidity, and multiple hospital, hospital visits, and possible operations. Um, there's been a lot of recent advances in treatments, specifically in regard to arthroscopic treatment for these conditions. Um, and as I've discussed, there's a lot of controversy regarding the acute management um, of dislocations, uh, whether they should be taken straight to theatre uh, for arthroscopy or repair, uh, or whether they should have non-operative measures initially. Um, so there are many different types of instability. Um, there are those that are congenital, uh, secondary to connective tissue disorders. Um, there are the acute traumatic we see most commonly. 97% uh, of these are anterior, um, and the rest posterior. Um, there are the chronic or recurrent cases, and there are the atraumatic cases, uh, voluntary cases uh, with multi-directional instability. Um, as a, to broadly categorise um, the types of dislocations we see into two groups, um, a surgeon called Matson in 1994 uh, described two groups called uh, there's TUBS and AMBRI. So the TUBS group are the ones that we most commonly see in our practice. So these are uh, traumatic, unidirectional, uh, the bank out lesion is normally present, and surgery, surgery is usually required for stabilisation, and often they have very good outcomes. Um, so to remember tubs, uh, they are torn loose. On the other hand, uh, the Ambry group, um, they're born loose. So generally these patients um, have atraumatic instability, often multidirectional, um, can be bilateral, can have family history of this as well. Um, for these patients, on the other hand, non-operative treatment is the, the best measure. Um, so therefore, they should have a rehab and physio program. And if all else fails, uh, generally the, the operation for them is inferior capsular shift. Um, so I'd like to talk about pathoanatomy. Um, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body. Um, it has very unique bony anatomy, which I'll talk about. Um, and to be able to, to stabilise itself, it must have synchronous action between the static and dynamic stabilisers, which is very important. Um, so the humeral head has three times the surface area of the articular surface of the glenoid. Um, the glenoid has about five to seven degrees retroversion, whereas the humeral head has about 25 to 30 degrees. Looking uh, laterally at the glenoid, you can see it's a, a pear-shaped uh, type anatomy. Um, the Labrum um, has some important jobs. Uh, number one, it deepens the glenoid cavity by about 50%. Um, it also uh, prevents instability in multiple directions. It also serves as an attachment uh, to capsule and also the important ligaments around the shoulder. The shoulder is able to create a negative pressure, uh, therefore essentially sucking the humeral head into the glenoid cavity. And um, there are three very important uh, ligaments among others, uh, which are based around the anterior inferior part of the shoulder. So I'll just go through those ligaments. Um, so you can see at the top the su um, superior glenohumeral ligament. So this has two attachments uh, from the superior anterior labrum, also the coracoid process, uh, up to the superior margin, less of tuberosity. Um, so this uh, prevents inferior displacements and also posterior placement with the arm adducted by the side. The middle glenohumeral ligament is attached to the anterior part of the labrum and to the inferior part of the lesser tuberosity. Uh, that prevents anterior translation of the humeral head in mid-abduction. And the main stabiliser of the shoulder in regard to the um, static stabilisers is the inferior glenohumeral ligament, uh, which is attached around the um, anterior inferior surface and inserts into the anatomical neck of the humeral head. 
and this um, prevents anterior translation of the humeral head um, in 90 degrees abduction, uh, which is the position um, where a lot of the discases that we see uh, will occur. Um, the dynamic stabilizers are basically all the muscular structures around the shoulder joint, uh, most importantly, the rotator cuff. Um, this essentially causes um, the humeral head to be compressed into the cavity of the benoid. Um, we can also look at the long headed biceps the scapulothoracic muscular, which are, of which there are very many. Um, and these muscles rely on proprioceptive neuromuscular control, so they're all working uh, in synchrony to um, stabilize the shoulder joint at the same time. Um, so you can imagine if you've got multiple muscles on either side of the shoulder joint, uh, you need a balanced net force uh, to keep the humeral head in congruity uh, with the glenoid cavity. Um, looking onto the right of the screen, uh, we can see that if one group of muscles, uh, let's say the supraspinatus muscle or one of the cuff muscles, um, has atrophy, uh, therefore you're likely to get a misaligned joint force and it's more likely to cause subluxation and dislocation. The same thing when you've got abnormal bony anatomy, uh, such as uh, altered version of the glenoid cavity, this can also lead to increased risk of instability. Um, so the main lesion we see in regard to um, anterior traumatic dislocations is that of Bankart lesion. This was described by Bankart in 1923. He described this as the essential lesion in anterior dislocations. Um, arthroscopic studies have shown and MRIs that around 85% of anterior dislocations uh, will have a Bankart lesion. Um, and essentially, it's an avulsion of the capture labral uh, complex from the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid. Um, the other anatomical uh, conditions we see with dislocation are glenoid rim fractures or bony bank cards. Um, these are very important to look for uh, within the investigations and workup for each uh, of the dislocations we'll see, um, as they can be the, lead, the cause for failures of arthroscopic stabilization, and also it may change our management in regard to surgical planning. Um, heel sacs is the deformity of the uh, posterior lateral humeral head. Um, you can see in the diagram, which is caused by impaction on the anterior glenoid rim. And this also is important to acknowledge in your investigation and workup, as this may also change uh, your surgical management. So, how do these patients present? Um, in regard to anterior dislocations, so they're normally the young patient, generally male, um, involved in contact sport. So, the dislocation is most likely occurred at risk, at risk position. So, in 90 degrees of duction, external rotation with a force which is directing the humerus anteriorly. Um, they can also occur, uh, occur from uh, direct impact uh, type injuries. Um, and some studies have shown that direct impact injuries uh, are more likely to cause long-term instability than in the at-risk condition. Um, the older patients we also see are those that have simple falls um, with dislocations, and they often have associated rotator cuff tears. In regard to posterior dislocations, uh, they're generally due to seizures, electric shocks, or severe trauma. Um, the reason they occur with seizures or electric shocks is that the uh, internal rotators of the shoulder are stronger than the external rotators, and these strong muscles pull the shoulder into a posterior dislocation. Um, it's very important to take a thorough history of this will guide your management, um, and you should uh, treat each patient individually. So you want to know how old they are. I'll discuss how important that is in the next couple of slides. Is it their first episode? How many episodes have they had? Um, how significant is the degree of trauma involved uh, with each of their dislocations? And are they able to voluntarily reduce it or do they need to come into emergency to have uh, be given sedation? Uh, you want to know their employment, is it their dominant arm? Do they do overhead activities, labour work, or do they lead a sedentary lifestyle? Um, the sporting activity and their patient expectations in regard to are they wanting to get back into sport um, and do they understand the natural history of the condition? Um, I'll try and briefly talk about examination. So acutely you want to know if there's any neurovascular injury. Uh, specifically, is there a brachial plexus injury? The most likely thing you'll see uh, in shoulder dislocation is an axillary nerve um, injury. So you'll be looking for uh, sensation um, over the deltoid area laterally. Um, and also you can see, even if you can't um, actively range, whether the deltoid is contracting. Um, you want to look for associated injuries. Um, when examining for recurrence or chronic instability, 
Um, there's, there's many tests you can do. So the app apprehension test. Um, so this again is at 90 degrees induction, external rotation with a posterior force. Um, anterior draw, this is a test we can see in the top right corner. Um, so you're stabilizing the scapular thoracic part of the shoulder and then um, palpating the humeral head and bring it forward to see if there is an increased anterior draw. Um, the bottom test you can see here is the load and shift test. So the uh, examiner is providing some axial force um, for the humeral head against the glenoid and then uh, shifting the humeral head anterior to see if there's uh, any increased glide. And this is graded out of three, uh, one being uh, minimal, uh, basically there's no significant glide. Two, two is when there's subluxation and spontaneous reduction. And three is when there's dislocation without spontaneous reduction. Um, so there's just an illustration of the apprehension test in the bottom right. Uh, and the sulcus test is when you pull the humerus inferiorly. You can do this in different uh, external and internal rotation measures. So there'll be an increased distance between the humeral head and the lateral part of the acromion. Um, investigation is going to start with the plain x-ray. So you want an AP lateral and an auxiliary view if possible. There's also some more specialised view, uh, such as this West Point view, which is illustrated uh, in the picture. Uh, that's a good view if you're looking at glenoid rim fractures. Um, and the striking notch view is an excellent view for looking at pill sex deformities. In regard to ordering CT scans, if you suspect a glenoid rim fracture or bony bank cart, um, this is an investigation of choice, particularly with uh, 3D reconstruction. It will also be good for looking at if there's any uh, fractures associated with that uh, dislocation of the humerus. Uh, but now MRI is really gold standard, and the uh, advent of arthrogram also gives us extra information. So this allows us to look at the labrum, uh, bank cart lesions, slap tears, uh, look at the capsule and ligamentous um, involvement and also the rotator cuff. Um, there are also some more specialised lesions it looks for, uh, such as the Hagel lesion, which is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligaments, and the ELPSA, which is uh, anterior labral uh, posterior sleeve avulsion. Uh, now, these uh, lesions, if they're present, may make arthroscopic stabilisation more difficult or less likely uh, to be successful. So they're important to pick up uh, on MRI. The management, uh, acute treatment I won't really go into, but there are multiple reduction uh, techniques involved, uh, obviously different for posterior dislocations. Um, but the main area of contention is the definitive treatment. So should we treat these non-operatively or operatively? And there are multiple dilemmas or controversies. So in regard to non-operative treatment, should we put these patients into internal rotation or external rotation in a sling to begin with? Uh, if we treat them operatively, should we do this acutely when they present or should we do it in a delayed fashion when they come back with the recurrent dislocations? Um, should the repair be arthroscopic or open? And should we repair or do we need to reconstruct? So to answer um, all these questions, we need to know exactly what the natural history of the disease is. So I'll talk about that now. Um, so if you look down the bottom left uh, corner, um, this is a slide summarising the age presentation of traumatic instability. Um, so you can see here that the highest number of presentations is within the 20 to 30 age group. Um, there's also some in the 30 to 40. And uh, as you'll see on a different slide here, the difference in the presentation of 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 in their outcome is, is very large. So one of the earliest studies looking up at the top left uh, by Rowe in the JBGS in 1957. Um, it's looked at 324 young patients with anterior dislocations. So you can see there that 94% um, recurrence in patients under the age of 20 years old, 62% in those under 30, and 14% for those over 40. So the age bracket is going to dramatically um, change the way you uh, treat these injuries. In regard to the incidence of recurrence after anterior dislocation, um, first of all, look down the right hand side. Um, so those less than 20 years, again, this is another study, uh, meta-analysis, which showed greater than 80% in less than 20. Uh, similar result uh, compared to row for the 20 to 40, and again, um, less than 10% for the over 40. And um, just up the top here on the right-hand side, uh, some meta-analysis, all showing that the rate of uh, non-operative recurrence is, is around about 80% for all studies. 
So uh, for those that are treated non-operatively, um, traditional um, position is to have the, the arm in an uh, adducted and internally rotated position. And that's generally uh, what, what I've seen uh, used. Um, there's a good study which came out of Japan um, by Ito et al. Um, they've now done a prospective randomised trial of 194 patients. Um, and they've been putting their patients into an external rotation type brace uh, in 10 degrees external rotation. Um, they had a minimum two year follow up and found the re recurrence rate was significantly different. So 42% in the internally rotated group versus 26% in the externally rotated group with a relative risk reduction of 38.2%. The way they think this works is that in an externally rotated position, the uh, subscapularis is under tension and therefore the subscapularis uh, will be uh, reducing the size of the anterior fusion and therefore placing the labrum anteriorly, pressing it against the glenoid and therefore aiding healing of those tissues. So moving on to operative treatment. Um, so in the last uh, decade to 20 years, arthroscopic uh, treatments probably have become one of the most common. Um, it's less invasive. The patients are able to get back uh, to work or sport generally quicker. However, it is technically demanding. Uh, it's very operator dependent. And there are multiple different fixation techniques which have evolved over the years. Um, and searching through the literature, definitely um, techniques and outcomes have improved uh, since they've moved on from things like transgenoid sutures uh, to suture anchors. So for open treatment, um, as I'll show you, there is still a lower rate of recurrence uh, in open treatment. However, that is generally the expense of loss of range of motion, especially with external rotation. Open treatment does allow us to address uh, bony defects or other uh, significant defects in the capsule. And generally, it's um, additionally uh, treated with a capsular shift type procedure, uh, which is illustrated in this diagram here. Um, there are some relative indications. So if there's a significant amount of bone loss, uh, then slightly <coughs> arthroscopic treatment would not be able to address this. Um, if you do need to do some type of capsular shift, generally arthroscopic means uh, would not allow that. If you've got an engaging hill sac lesion, you won't be able to fix this with an arthroscopic stabilisation. Uh, I mentioned briefly before, these ELFs or haggle type lesions sometimes need open stabilisation. And obviously if you've had failed arthroscopic procedures, then you may want to change that to an open procedure. So what does the literature say? Um, I haven't really quoted any individual studies, so they vary so widely. So I've tried to sort of summarise these with a few um, meta-analysis or reviews articles. So um, this article came out of the JB Days 2004. I looked at multiple studies between 1991 and 2002 uh, and found the overall rate of recurrence with arthroscopic treatment was 19% uh, in the arthroscopic group versus 7% in the open group. You can see here, um, there's a general trend in the early studies up here, uh, results clearly favoured uh, the open group. However, I think as the uh, uh, technology and also the experience improves, uh, we'll see that the arthroscopic open group did become a bit uh, closer in their outcomes. There was another meta-analysis formed later in 2007. This had very, very similar results. Um, they looked at 18 studies, the rate of recurrence, um, they also looked at a thing called a road score, which looked at the stability, motion, and function, um, functional outcome. And however, they found that the arthroscopic group uh, still had a 2.37% uh, um, relative risk of recurrence compared to the open group. That was 12% versus 5%, so similar sort of figures. Um, however, the arthroscopic group did have these better row scores, and most of them were due to a reduced range of motion in the open group. Um, they did find a slightly um, uh, better return to work, however, uh, in the open group, and that was statistically significant. Uh, this brings me to another topic, um, whether, these, whether patients with acute uh, anterior dislocation should have acute surgical repair. Uh, I couldn't find any decent uh, randomised trials really to compare um, acute treatment versus delayed treatment or long-term outcomes in regards to this. However, um, on reading this in the review articles, these are for a very select group of patients. Um, it allows us to evacuate the hematoma and theoretically improve the healing of the tissues around the labrum and capsule. Um, it reduces the risk of uh, further operations, um, further hospital stays and morbidity. 
However, uh, due to the acute nature of the injury, obviously there's more likely to be bleeding or active bleeding within the joint, which will make scope harder. Uh, you could have fluid extravasation if there's a, um, a rent in the capsule, uh, making arthroscopy difficult, and uh, friable tissue may be harder to repair. Um, I think if, if we uh, saw all our acute dislocations um, in clinic within, you know, within a week and put them on for arthroscopic uh, stabilisation, then there's absolutely no way we'd be able to do this in regard to our service. So it's, it's almost impossible in a public type service to deliver that uh, type of care. Uh, so it's not really feasible. Um, however, in a private or highly you know, uh, professional sport type situation, then it, it may be appropriate. Um, however, uh, looking back, around 80% of people in the young active group uh, will go into recurrence. There's about 20% that won't. So therefore, if you go and stabilise um, everyone, there's about 20% of people who are having unnecessary operations. Uh, so you should also consider that. Um, there's also uh, some reconstructive techniques. Uh, so these are used uh, when there's significant bony defects, uh, bony bank arts, uh, or failed uh, arthroscopic or other open types of repair. Uh, the putty plate is a historical type of repair using the subscap. Um, the one you occasionally see here is Bristow Latage, where the uh, coracoid is detached with a conjoined tendon um, from the coracoid process. And this is used as a bony block and anchored into the anterior glenoid rim. As you can see here in this diagram, uh, you can also use other types of uh, either crest bone graft blocks or uh, new operations. There's some studies reporting other graft use. Um, so to conclude, uh, traumatic anterior dislocation has a high likelihood of recurrence in the young and active population. Um, patients really need to be uh, managed on an individual basis. Um, so you need a thorough history examination, you need to know about the patient expectations, sporting activity, um, before you can make a decision on treatment. Um, appropriate imaging will guide your surgical options, uh, specifically looking uh, for uh, the type of labral tear they have, uh, any bony bank arts, and making sure that's appropriately uh, investigated to begin with. Um, open stabilisation, clearly based on all the studies I've seen, does have a, a lower recurrence rate. Um, however, arthroscopic repair I feel based on a trend in the literature, um, does have um, likely, uh, sorry, there are likely to be improved results in the future with better technology, better technical expertise and more experience amongst the general surgical population. Um, and there's ongoing debate and further studies are required to look at whether acute surgical management of anterior dislocations is warranted.